thank you that with the host of heaven, we can join in and praise here. And uh, we are so grateful. We look forward to joining in with that throng for all of eternity. But for now, Lord, thank you for helping us raise our voices and, and for raising our awareness of your greatness, your love, your mercy, your goodness. And I pray as uh, we worship together and uh, gather around your word now for uh, uh, just the rest of the morning, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, show us more of your glory and more of your heart. And uh, we will praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see you all. Uh, church visible and local, and then uh, church digital and electronic. Good to see everybody out there. We are going to be in the book of Jonah today. And uh, the book of Jonah is about as deep into your Bible as the prophet was into the fish. So... If you find uh, the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and then just start flipping back toward the front, uh, seven short books, because these are the uh, minor prophets, and in my Bible, it's about 43 pages. If you've got a larger Bible, like Carl's, the uh, Andre the Giant edition, um, it's probably only about five or six pages, um, and please be sure to lift with your legs, okay? <laughs> I want to remind you while you're finding the book of Jonah that um, we are starting, uh, we're get, kind of getting back into the groove of our of normalcy, if you will, and our adult uh, Bible fellowship group, which meets in the fellowship hall. So that'll be the ninth. And then on the 16th, uh, a good friend of mine and, and ours, uh, Steve Bender will be here. Steve is the uh, associate missions director for the Baptist Bible Fellowship International. He has been here uh, before, and I'm looking forward to having him fill the pulpit on that day uh, as our guest. Now, my, my plan for today, the approach to the message is a little bit different than what I, uh, the way I normally do it. Um, the, the book of Jonah is four chapters, but it's it's very short. It's 48 verses all told. And it's really difficult to just kind of pick and choose without reading the whole book and, and getting the flavor. So what I want to do is give you some points of interest right off the bat. And then as we explore the message, of course, this we're still in our series. This is the eighth sermon in our Not Just for Kids uh, series, and today I'm, I'm going to speak to you uh, from the heart of Jonah, Jonah, what I learned about God while fishing, okay? And so um, I want you to understand from the book itself the heart of God, and there is a, a, a greater message here than a prophet being swallowed by a fish, much greater message, all right? So points of interest, uh, and so what I'm saying is as after the points of interest, we're going to read a chapter. I'll give you the point uh, uh, about God, what God wants you to know, and then we'll go to the next chapter. And I'm really hoping to spend the bulk of the time on the fourth chapter because that's the heart of the book. That's, the, that's where the message really is. Uh, but you need to understand the whole story. So the Bible tells us that uh, Jonah came from a town called Gath Hefer, uh, which is four miles outside of what we know of as Nazareth today. Um, and God told him to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. Assyria was always a threat to Israel. Uh, they, were, they were gaining uh, uh, some, some power and always threatening to invade. And uh, this occurred uh, during the reign of Jeroboam II. Now, Nineveh was 500 miles east of where Jonah was when God told him to go. And uh, Jonah decided I'll just, you, many of you know this, he decided he wanted to go a different direction. He wanted to go to Tarshish, uh, a Phoenician colony on the southwest border of what we know of today as Spain, 2,000 miles the opposite direction, okay? Now, uh, Jeroboam II was the king of the northern kingdom called Israel. And you remember that after Solomon's reign, 
the, the kingdom split in two. And Jeroboam I went up to the north and established the kingdom up there with an idolatrous form of worship. And uh, the northern kingdom was very, uh, always, uh, very rarely do you find a, a, a king uh, being congratulated for his righteousness from the northern kingdom. And Jonah is only one of very few prophets called uh, from the, the northern kingdom to the northern kingdom. And during Jeroboam II's reign, uh, he had regained a whole bunch of territory that had been lost and brought, uh, brought that northern kingdom back to uh, uh, where it had been under Solomon as far as its size and its strength and its prosperity, extremely prosperous uh, to the point that... Um, uh, the Jewish encyclopedia says, oppression and exploitation of the poor by the powerful and luxury in palaces of uh, unknown before splendor and a craving for amusement were some of the internal fruits of Jeroboam's external triumphs. The more things change, the more they stay the same, don't they? They sure do. And um, <clears throat> Jonah was a contemporary of the prophets Amos and Hosea, who had already been preaching and prophesying. They were down in, in, in Judah, they were, but uh, they were prophesying that God was going to use Assyria to come in and punish Israel because of their waywardness and their constant sinning against God. Remember, we're talking uh, years upon years upon years. Jeroboam was the... Uh, the 13th king of the northern kingdom, and his reign lasted for uh, 40, 41 years, something like that. So we're not talking about a matter of days or weeks. We're talking about a matter of decades upon decades where God sends his messengers, tells them, tells them to get right with him, and they don't. And they keep sinning against God, and they keep adding to their, um, uh, their, their sins and their rebellion against the Lord. And God says, I'm going to use Assyria to come in and punish. Um, now, Assyria did that. And uh, they, they fell eventually in 1612 to Babylon. We just learned a little bit about Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. So, Assyria fell to Nebuchadnezzar uh, in 1612. Um, <clears throat> I find it very interesting that the chief god of the Assyrians was Dagon. Now, Dagon was half man, half fish. He was a merman. He was their chief deity. Now, this is very interesting. Archaeology uh, has discovered, archaeological evidence, that Ninevite fishermen actually lived on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, around where Jonah got coughed up. Interesting, interesting. Because as we read the book, we understand that when he got to Nineveh, people understood something was different and they responded to that message. I'm not going to steal the thunder if you don't know the story, okay? I'm trying, trying to keep it, uh, keep it fresh, all right? Now, let me give you, of course, what the critics say. You've got to hear from the critics, right? Because if you don't hear now, you'll hear it eventually, <laughs> They say that it's impossible for somebody to survive inside a fish for three days and three nights. Now, I give you two answers to that. First of all, remember what we learned on Easter about how the Jews, uh, um, how they kept time and, and days and nights, all right? Uh, sundown to sundown was a day, and any any part of the day or the night was referred to as a day. So it doesn't necessarily mean just like uh, uh, we have, you know, Jesus in the grave on Friday and then resurrected on Sunday because there were parts of those, of those days, sundown to sundown, three days and three nights. That's, that's what he said. So it's, it's very conceivable that Jonah was not 
in three day and three nights in the fish like we would count the 24-hour days, all right? And yet, he was there. Uh, they would say that, um, well, let me give you the second answer to that. God. Okay? Divine intervention. And by the way, this is where the critics are always stumbling. They don't want to believe in an almighty, all-powerful, sovereign God. Period. Even those who say they are believers. By the way, some of these arguments that I have came from a professor of theology at a famous divinity school. And you wonder, you wonder why our, our country is going mad. Because our universities and our colleges are stacked full of people who say they're experts in the Bible and in theology, and all they do is tear it down. So our kids are coming out saying, yeah, that's just silly stuff. I got a little off the track here, but... You get it. Another criticism is it's unlikely that the people of Nineveh would have received somebody of a different language and a different religion. Unlikely does not equal impossible. And remember, something different happened. Something was going on that God had prepped people for Jonah's arrival. Now, some want to criticize that uh, when it says Jonah journeyed three days through the city of Nineveh, that that's false because the city was only about eight miles in circumference. Yet, yet, historians and archaeologists agree that when you go back to Genesis 10, Genesis 10 talks about uh, Nimrod expanding his territory to Assyria, building the cities of Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kela, Rezin, that great city located between Nineveh and Kela. And they say that these cities were all there and they formed a composite city, all of which were called Nineveh, in more of a general sense. So yeah, a three-day journey, sure, easy peasy. And then again, remember our three days, three nights situation. Then they criticize the wording. Well, in Jonah, it says a great fish. In the Gospels, Jesus said a whale. That's a moot point that is an erroneous argument because the Hebrew word for great fish and the Greek word for whale are generic terms that mean any aquatic creature. All right? We know a whale is a mammal. We get it. You read. We understand. And, and you see, that's what the critics do. They, they love to interpret according to their particular day, age, world view and their particular mindset and definition of words without doing the research. And that's dangerous. Now, let me give you, I think, the most solid answer for the critics. Jesus said... What did Jesus say? All right, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Was Jesus the Son of God, God the Son, or not? There's no in between. 
Some, some like to say, well, he was a prophet. Go back and read the law of Moses. God told Moses, you'll know a prophet comes in my name because what he says is 100% true and all of it will come to pass. The sign of Jonah. Jesus did it. Rose from the dead. Right? How about this one? He said in Luke chapter 11 and verse 30, as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites that God sent him, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. So Jesus said Jonah was actually in the fish. He said Jonah prefigured his resurrection from the dead, and he said that Nineveh actually repented. So to all the critics and all the arguments, everything you want to throw our way, but Jesus said, period, period. And what you have to do now is you have to say Jesus was wrong. And oh, that's a slippery slope. That's thin ice to be on, friends. So here we go. What are we going to learn about God from the book of Jonah? Let's read chapter 1 together. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of uh, Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, uh, uh, Assyria was known as a very cruel nation. They treated their captives and, and other people, they treated them with great inhumanity. And God says, their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish." And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now let me just offer one thought here. There are consequences for rebelling against God. And we are not islands unto ourselves. So they said, please tell us for whose cause this trouble, uh, is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? You understand they recognized the God of the Hebrews as mightier than the gods they were praying to and worshiping, okay? <clears throat> For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will be calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Wherefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, we pray, O Lord, please do not not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you O Lord have done as it pleased you so they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows God will be glorified will he not now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now listen, folks. I don't care. I don't care what they say 
If it was a whale, we know that most whales, they, they can't swallow people. We, if it was, if it was a, a grouper, uh, it doesn't matter. God created and prepared a great fish to swallow his prophet. <laughs> First thing Jonah learns about God, God knows. God knows. He knows our whereabouts. <laughs> you cannot hide from God. I mean, maybe if I, maybe if I make a lead, a lead shield around me. You know, no, God's bigger than Superman. He can see through lead too. He knows where you are. And he knows all about you. The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. See, God's everywhere. And you can't hide. You can't outrun him. And the thing about God is not only does he know where you are, he knows what's going on in your heart. And he's the only one, the Bible says, who knows the depths of our heart. Because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it but God? And God knows. He knows the excuses we make. He knows the reasons we're, we're trying to run. We, he, knows, he knows the fabrications, right? Well, you know, if I do this, uh, but this is much better than, right? Uh, just think of the, that Phoenician colony that could use my preaching. Uh, the, these, not these Ninevites. I could do much more good 2,000 miles away. God said, no, go to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh. God knows you intimately. That should scare you, but it also should rejoice you. Because there are times when we don't even know what's going on inside of us. I love where Paul wrote that the Holy Spirit, those of you who know Christ as your Savior, the Spirit of God dwells within you. And Paul said sometimes we don't know what to pray. But the Spirit makes intercession for us because God knows our hearts. And the Holy Spirit is actually lifting us up. Saying, uh, Father, this is, this is what's going on. We, and, and you know. All right? So God knows. Now let's look at chapter 2 because we're running out of time. All right? Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol... Uh, I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I've been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the, mornings, uh, to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever, yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. God knows, and God hears. God hears. I doubt very highly Jonah could uh, uh, verbalize that prayer that we just read. And he may have been on the verge of blacking out. I don't know. But he finally said, God, I'm sorry. God, you're God. And you know, we come to a, when we come to a place like that, 
when we finally say, God, you win, your way is right, you're always good, God, forgive me for my sins, God hears those prayers. And sometimes it might not even be because of sin in our lives, but sometimes we feel like we're in the belly of the fish and it's getting hard to breathe and life is just wrapped all around our heads like seaweed and man, you can't really figure it out. God hears. Oh God, save me from this. Help me, give me strength to get through it. God hears. You see, he's a loving God. He knows what he's doing. And he's got this. I like that. He's got it. So God knows, and God hears. He hears our cries for help. Now let's read chapter 3, because I said I wanted to focus on 4. <laughs> I'm not going to have enough time. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now notice, he didn't even preach what God told him to preach. I'll let you go back and look that up. <laughs> so the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God gives. God gives mercy. I like that. God is a merciful God. And when people repent, that means turning Right, one 180 degree turn from my own way, my own thoughts, my own actions, my own decisions for my own pleasure, my own wants. And I say, God, forgive me, I have sinned and now I want to walk on your path. I'm going to follow you. You know what God says? Forgiven. Forgiven. He's a God of mercy. He gives mercy, and he's the God of second chances. Oh, man, I am so glad of that because there are times when I feel like I'm on my fifth or sixth second chance. <laughs> That's how gracious and loving and merciful God is. In Psalm 86, the psalmist wrote this, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Let me very quickly tell you what the scriptures say about sin and forgiveness. We cannot earn forgiveness by anything we do. That's not how it works. That's not God's way because there's none righteous. No one does righteousness all the time. All right, none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. So where are we? Doomed? Because God is also just and righteous. But because of his love and because of his mercy, he sent his son to take your place, my place, the place of everybody on the planet, and what we deserve on the cross. 
And he took our sins upon himself. And our sins were nailed to that tree with him. And he paid the sacrifice. He paid the penalty, which is death. You say, well, how come that... That's a whole other sermon. God is so holy that any little sin is an affront to an all-holy and just God. So he sent his son to pay that penalty for us so that whoever believes in him, whoever puts their faith in him, now it doesn't mean believe in your head. It means place your faith, the faith of your heart on Jesus and what he did on the cross for you 2,000 years ago. It doesn't mean I believe Jesus in my head and now I do all sorts of religious works. Jesus did not come to establish a religion. He came to reestablish a relationship, a relationship that was broken by sin. So religion and good works are not going to get you to heaven. Repentance and faith in Jesus, receiving Christ into your life to be your personal Savior by faith. We're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of our good works. Otherwise, we'd boast about it. Paul wrote that in Ephesians chapter 2. God knows, God hears, God gives. And now let's look at chapter 4 very quickly. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. What did? The fact that Nineveh repented and God didn't do what he said he was going to do. Didn't destroy him. And he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. (laughs) In the love of Jesus. (laughs) Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. Just waiting. Well, maybe God will still destroy it. (laughs) So he went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God had prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. (laughs) He was a cranky prophet, wasn't he? (laughs) This guy is, you you do not want to pattern your ministry after Jonah. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons which cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. Here's the meat and potatoes of the book of Jonah. Why did Jonah flee? Yeah, maybe fear of the Assyrians had a little bit to do with it, but that wasn't the main reason. He didn't believe the Assyrians deserved God's mercy. He wanted to see God's vengeance on them. He was a Hebrew. He didn't didn't worship idols like they do. I mean, they they were spiritually head and shoulders above the Assyrians. 
And surely, God, you don't want me to go and preach mercy to them, give them a chance to repent. I'm going to go the other way because I don't want to see it happen. I want to see them die. I want to see them annihilated. You say, man, that's, that's pretty heartless. That's, that's pretty bad for, for a prophet of God. I ask you to examine your heart and your attitude toward others, toward people around you, toward other nations and people groups. Sometimes I think we're as guilty as Jonah. But you see, here was a reluctant missionary. He didn't want to go. Oh, he, he would go and preach over in Tarshish. But not the Assyrians. Mm-mm. God rained down fire on their heads. And God says, don't I love them? See, here's the beauty of God. He loves everyone equally. Again, he's a just God. Sin does get punished. Absolutely. The fourth fourth thing Jonah learned about God is God cares. God cares. He cares about everyone and he wants us to do the same. Now, Now, loving people doesn't mean we agree with the way they live. It doesn't mean we agree with, with lifestyles and, and verbiage and, and, and you name it that are outside the bounds of Holy Scripture. But look at how Jesus handled that. He handled that with love. And the Bible says that he was the friend of tax collectors and sinners. Notorious sinners, egregious sinners. Why? They all listened to him. They weren't judgmental like the religious leaders. He wasn't judgmental like the religious leaders. He loved them, but he shared the truth with them. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Right? And our job is not to condemn. Our job is not to pray, God, rain down fire and brimstone on these people. Our, God is, our, our, our job is to say, God, help me to show mercy and love and share the gospel of Jesus Christ because he is the embodiment of mercy and love, the mercy and love of Almighty God. So you see, chapter 4 is the crux of the whole matter. And I don't know about you, but it's convicting. The story of Jonah is not primarily about a man who was swallowed by a great fish and then miraculously regurgitated alive three days later. It's the story of a reluctant missionary who refused to see the world through the loving eyes of his God. It's the story of one who begrudgingly delivered God's message of salvation. And one who angrily complained when God extended his mercy to those that he believed didn't deserve it. It's a story that epitomizes, I think, too many of God's people today. People who seem to be focused only on themselves. People who are too selfishly tight-fisted with their money to give liberally to the missionary work and heart of Almighty God. People who crave temporal pleasure more than eternal souls. And divine retribution more than heaven's grace. We don't need more Jonas. We've got too many already. 
We need more Barnabases, Silases, Timothys. We need more Judsons, Taylors, Careys of our own missionary family that our church supports. We need more Anzalones, more Hovings, more Joneses, more Sullivans. People who are willing to see the world through the eyes of God, the eyes of mercy, and the eyes of love, and share Jesus with them. So I'm asking you, will you give? Will you go? Will you care? So you can see that the story of Jonah is more than just a fish story. Critics aside, kids' Sunday school lessons aside, there's a serious message that God wants us to get from Jonah the prophet. And that is, we need to have the same eyes and the same heart that God has for the lost, no matter who they are, no matter what nation, no matter what people, no matter what personalities. God loves everyone. And he loved the world so much that he sent his son to die for them as well as for you. And so I wonder today if maybe you would begin looking at the people around you and the people in our world with a little different perspective. Maybe your prayer today is, God, forgive me. Forgive me for having such a hard heart and for looking down on people and being so angry with them or, or wanting to see you uh, release your vengeance and your justice on them. That time's coming. But right now, like the scriptures say, God is being very patient because he is very merciful and he is very desirous that none should perish but that all should come to repentance. I want to thank you again for tuning in. And I want to thank you again for your financial support for this ministry. We give the glory to God. All that we do is for His glory. And if you need anything, please let us know. We're here for you. We want to pray with you if you need it. We want to thank you. God bless you. I'll see you next time on Heritage Park Live.